I'm Matthew, one of the hosts of the show. This week's episode is going to be a little different than the handful that we've done so far in that I'm interviewing Doris de Cuba. Doris is a front-end developer who lives in the Netherlands and has a passion for accessibility and inclusivity in design. We had a great conversation about inclusivity in design, which I hope you'll stick around for. One of the things I wanted to let you know is that the cadence of today's episode is a little bit different because I had to type everything that I wanted to say to Doris, and she had to read it and respond to me. Now, I'm not going to make you sit through all the slow typing, oh, spelling mistake, oh, 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 that I did. Uh, so I cut all that stuff down. And instead, I'll be doing a lot of voiceover of the things that I said. And then, of course, I'll let Doris speak for herself. With that, let's get to it. Thanks for watching. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Have a day off from work. And today is election day in the Netherlands. National holiday? Nope. We just work. And you can vote from, I think, 7 in the morning until 9 at night. But you have the day off. I do. It's my regular day off on Wednesday. Cool. So I have to think, then type. Two different parts of the brain. Slow brain. Sure enough, Brad. I mean, even if I had a translator, it would have been a bit fast. I wanted to chat with you about the inclusive design that you've been writing about. Yeah, right, right, yes. And I'm a slow typist, sorry. And I'm a know-how, so take your time. Do you think something like this will work? I think it would work, you know, I'm used to reading a text slowly, and even when I have a translator, I kind of have to wait for the translator to hear what's being said, and then translate it for me. So for me, it's regular, normal. I'm just thinking if you're going to put it on YouTube and the viewers will not hear you. So you will have to like type your question and then speak it out. Yes. Okay, good point. I also had to put on my glasses to read what I'm typing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So a little bit about the purpose of our show, context setting. Right. Basically, we're focused on experience design topics. And I put focus in quotes because within that, we don't focus. Right. So any general topic within that is up for grabs, mostly. Okay. Experience design, right, right. Well, I have plenty of tools, uh, you know, being deaf. So I'm always in a mode of analyzing everywhere I go. Like, so are you doing it with healthcare? You're working to help healthcare? Mostly. Right. And... So I visit the hospital often here, and currently our hospital uh, in the Netherlands, or the ones I visit, uh, have a kind of a check-in system now, right, at the hospital. Okay. So if you have an appointment and you enter the lobby of the hospital and you have to uh, like scan your passport or your D-card, and it will look up your appointment. And um, for starters, that's unaccessible to blind people. Right. And I get kind of a number, and then I go to the waiting room of the department have to be. And basically, I have to sit with my number and, you know, stare at the screen until my number is called. And if it's my own doctor, I don't have to mind very much because they know I'm deaf. So they will come in yeah. and, you know, like, hey, your turn. But when you have an appointment with a doctor that doesn't know you, okay, good luck. I really have to pay attention. And I talk to someone else who is also uh, visually disabled. And, uh, and his hospital also use number. So he has to, like use his phone and like zoom in on the number so you can see which number is being called. And now luckily they still have, you know, people working so you can actually interact with people, but I can imagine, you know, they're trying to phase that out. So basically that just implementing system and, you know, a hospital has a lot of people who are disabled and the, those systems are built for healthy people without, without disabled. So for the people who can hear, who the people are, who are not visually impaired, and just can kind of bug me because when they come to your system, do they think about asking real people to test them before implementing that? And you know who visits the hospitals a lot? Elderly people. And I feel so bad. Uh, often I see them struggling and I tell them to no, hold on, I'm gonna get someone to help you out with your system. And you can see the relief on their face that someone is coming to help them just to punch out a number for the appointment. So there's nothing built in the system that triggers... Yeah, it's like a button for get help, right? One would think, you know, there would be a button for call someone to come and help you. Yeah. Okay, no, there's nothing like that. I mean, there are people standing in the hall, in the lobby to help you. 
but at peak hours, it's very, very busy and just hospitals. So like, you really have to do your best to get attention. Nothing where you scan in your passport and that makes the staff know to do something different. That would be my preference, right? Uh, you know, I'm deaf and every time I ask, can you put in the system, you know, that I'm deaf and do not call me if there's anything, but send me an email. The doctor assistant, she knows me for a while. She said, you know, I'm going to email the technical department and ask them. And they send just, you know, your standard email. Yes, we don't do that. The system doesn't support that. And that's right. a stupid answer. That's a stupid answer. I mean, we both go, you just go into the system and you put in a field yeah. patient is deaf and prefers to get an email instead of a phone call. Or a patient is blind and prefers to get a phone call instead of an email. But such simple things are not implemented in a hospital system. And it just boggles my mind, why not? It's not very basic, well, customer service. Knowing who your customers are and adjusting accordingly. Right, right. And maybe I'm in my own bubble, but I'm thinking of hospital. <laughs> right. We're all in our own bubble. Which, which is why doing research and getting out and talking to people is a good thing. Right. And... I read, for example, that Microsoft is really putting a lot into accessibility. Mm. And the way of thinking is, if you're going to design accessible stuff, we're going to involve people with disabilities right from the start. And right. we're going to work together with them to create our products. But many places are like, we're going to create a persona from a book we read. I still have to translate that blog I wrote to English that, for example, I'm deaf, but I'm late deaf. But another deaf person is not the same deaf person as I am. Um, so someone who is prelingual deaf means they were deaf before they turned four. So they didn't grow up with spoken language. And their mother language is actually sign language, Dutch mm -hmm. sign language. And Dutch sign language and Dutch spoken language are two very different things. So someone like that might not want to even get an email and I would have to talk to such a person and find out how they would prefer the communication. I lost my hearing when I was, I think, 26, 27. So I'm post-lingual deaf. You know, by the time I became deaf, I already speak four languages. And so I prefer text. That's my personal preference. Mm. So even within the disability of deafness or the disability of blindness, there are several differences between these people. It's very hard, and I understand it's very hard. I mean, we, we know we cannot make something accessible for everyone. So the goal to is always do it as best as we can. Right, with intention. With intention, right. But my opinion is get people from the start to work with you. And don't make assumptions from something you read in a book. So actually talk to people who are not you. Right, right. Accessibility is more than providing a skip to content link. Oh, so very much. So very much. I mean, I'm a developer, I'm a front-end developer, and that's how I started writing about this thing, because all I read was, um, should I use Ar Araya? I hope I'm speaking it right in English, Araya. Mm -hmm. Should I use Araya here? Should I use Araya there? And I understand that screen readers are very important. But then I go to a website and I want to order food, and that website does not have a text box. That I can comment, you know, I'm deaf, so please send me a text message. Don't call me if anything is wrong with my order. Such right. basic things. Right. And I think we developers don't think about that. And I kind of think that's a job too. So it's not about code and technology and skip the button or adding all text to an image. Just that's all good. But you have to go beyond that. It's the experience, like you said. Right. Yeah. Really understanding how people do communicate and how they wish to communicate. Yes, so. yes. I think, you know, communication is a very tricky thing. <laughs> it's highly frustrating. It takes time and patience. And I was kind of writing for myself, sorting my thought yesterday, and I came to the sentence, we want our communication to be fast and fluent. So that's why a lot of people don't want to email. They rather take a phone and call. In the Netherlands, we have the GDPR privacy laws right now. So some people grab that as an excuse. So last time I asked my doctor, so, okay, fine. Can you mail me when you get those results, please? And she was like, oh yeah, but I cannot mail you due to the privacy laws. 
and I was like, but I am giving you permission to marry me, right? And the funny thing is, um, the accessibility law in the Netherlands was implemented before the privacy law. And till today, yet people haven't really grasped, okay, it's required by law. But the moment the privacy law went in, everyone, I mean, just cookie walls went up faster than you can blink. Yeah. yeah. So why? Why do we, our company, oh, you don't know how many emails we, the Dutch, were getting the week that privacy law went in. So everyone that had our email, everyone that had, had our information, the status was sent up, you know, just required me. We now have to abide by the GBR law and know that they blah, 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 blah. But meanwhile, the accessibility law is already, you are still fighting to get it done. Yeah. Still fighting, right? And yeah. I don't know, it's like an uphill battle. Well, that's the thing. For me, about accessibility as a general concept is that everyone will need some sort of assistance at some point or points in their lives. Yes, I think um, people who are healthy and don't have a disability do not like to think about that it could be them someday needing just... I wasn't always deaf. I never thought I'd be deaf, right? I know many people with disability, they weren't born with disability. I mean, one day you are, you have no disability and the next you have a disability. And there's also that disability, none of us will get out of it, it's getting old. I mean, I'm 37 and I'm already squinting at some website to read the text. Uh, you know, like, I cannot read that or there are too much animation that drives me crazy. Oh, please, I just want, I like crossing on Tumblr, but sometimes, <laughs> It's way too much yeah, for me yeah. to process. So I think that's that's a problem, right? Uh, when people are healthy and they don't have disabilities, they don't want to think about it. They don't want to think about it. And a lot of people also think, oh yeah, but, but my visitors don't have a disability. Somehow that's something they think about. Oh, or maybe, oh yeah, but how many people have a disability? One, two, three, or five, right? But now that's not the point. Even if you have only one visitor, you should be accessible to everyone. I mean, especially if you are a business, I mean. And right. I also read a research they have done, can I remember the name? And a lot of people assume that people with disabilities are poor or don't have money to spend. I don't know why they make that connotation. Maybe they think people with disabilities don't work. I don't know why people think like that. Mm -hmm. But that's simply not true. Right. Right. So right, I have money to spend, right? I have money to spend. So I'm going to your website and I want to order food. Food that is expensive, but you don't make it possible for me. All right. Your loss is another one's win. Uh, um, next time I talk to someone, I'm not going to recommend you either. <laughs> You're off my list. Exactly. Right. The company will lose out on revenue. And then they're off other people's lists whom you tell. Word of mouth. Continue to lose revenue. Right. If people care about me, or, you know, they care about accessibility, I'm just going to say, you know, I'd rather you support that business instead of that business. And something they forget about mail communication, uh, since WhatsApp has become so popular, and you're always seeing online, oh, man, someone is calling me. Why is someone calling me? I'm not going to answer the phone. <laughs> Apparently, there's something new that people hate talking on the phone. I read that a lot online. I know just people don't have disability, but just, just hate talking on the phone. They get anxiety when the phone rings. So I think, you know, going text-based communication, and everybody wants. So I think, I think text-based communication gets a lot of bad reputation. Even though you're all out the whole day on a WhatsApp or other texting message, every day you're sitting in the train, you're sitting in the bus, and even walking down the street, people are texting each other. Right. So I don't understand why business or hospital have a problem implementing text-based communication. Yeah, I think it's about the difference between asynchronous and synchronous communication. Right, right. Like, like the problem arises when it's synchronous. Can you explain me a bit more why, what you meant? Yeah. So in your example of people walking down the street, while they're texting, they're asynchronous. In a hospital, when a person gets put in front of them, then it's synchronous. So the expectation of someone between asynchronous and synchronous, with asynchronous, waiting for a response is fine. And waiting during synchronous communication is not fine. Does that make sense? Right, right. 
but um, that's the thing about being inclusive to other people. Right. You have to meet right. each other in the middle. You yeah. have to meet each other in the middle. Uh, I'm struggling a lot myself right now because I'm learning sign language currently. So, which means I'm meeting more people that are prelingual deaf that only use sign language. And people that are prelingual deaf, not everyone is really good at spoken language because it's just not their language. I mean, just like I don't know Chinese, or if I would learn Chinese right now, I would be very bad at it. So I can sign language basic stuff because I'm just starting. But if I meet someone who does sign language and I can follow it and I ask them to type it for me, mm. even if they master the spoken language, they are not very happy that they have to text for me. And it happens also with hearing people because it just takes too much effort. I really have to go learn sign language really well so I can communicate with prelingual deaf people. And with hearing people, it's an all different thing. I will just have to meet hearing people that don't mind texting. So uh, the learning is going well. I mean, I have classes every Thursday, and now I have only sign language. And I have a stack of books <laughs> I need to practice and videos. So it goes. But I find it makes me think about the thing of being inclusive is and understand is hard because even when I meet someone who is completely deaf and only sign language, I do have to really check myself. I am I speaking clear enough? Am I using the signs I know right? You know, doing my best so the other person can understand me. So I know it really takes an effort. But what many people do is, you know, it takes too much effort, never mind. And that's where we that's where we need to do better. And it's hard, but being inclusive is not easy. Yes, but I think, how do I want to say this? I think that in some respects, inclusivity needs to be rebranded as increased revenue for businesses, including hospitals. And I say rebranded sort of tongue in cheek. I think I follow, I think I follow. We, we have to make them see how it's good for business. And kind of inclusivity, inclusive has that, that word, inclusive and accessibility have kind of a bad connotation in the business world, let's put it like that. So you have to talk to managers and, you know, other money makers. But my premise is to talk to them about inclusivity in their language. In some respects, accessibility and inclusivity are jargon words. We have to say, increase your revenue by 13%. Right. I, I mean, you know, right. jargon. You know, it's, it's kind of still in its infancy, but you're right, that jargon word, I I can understand. I mean, if you're going to talk to a manager that sits on the 12th floor and, you know, it's not down there with people, I can understand. So we have to see it, make them see it from their point of view. The tricky thing, what I come across a lot when talking to people about this is we need to create awareness. It's still about a bubble and now I'm going to be very pop culture, I like. We need more TV shows to include people with disabilities. Because we know one thing we got in common, we all see it on Netflix. So we need to create awareness. We can't just keep using Marley Maitland. She's great, but... I mean, Marley Maitland is good. You know, I often use Netflix as an example of good accessibility because they got captions in several languages. I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but I hate caption in Dutch. Actually, I've spoken, yes, the translation is never well, but I, so I never go to the movies. So when I'm watching Netflix, I'm always watching, if the thing is originally spoken in English, I watch it in English. It's originally spoken in Spanish, I watch it in Spanish, the mm -hmm. subtitles. And also for people with a visual disability, there is the audio description, right? But up until 2012, people had to take Netflix to court to get just done. So Netflix was actually sued, and I don't take my word on just, but I think Marilyn Maitland was behind the group of people who were pushing for caption. So it's not like Netflix of the good of the heart woke up one day and said, we're going to do caption. Why? Right? They had to take them for it. So that brings me back that we need awareness. And I think Marilyn has done a lot. Marilyn has done a lot for that people. But she's just one person, she can do only so much. Right, and you know, Beyonce just got sued for her website. I don't know if you yeah. read that. Yes, recently. Yes, because uh, a 
blind visitor wants to visit the website, but was inaccessible. So they sued the website of Beyonce for being unaccessible. Okay. Well, we shouldn't be suing the website, you know. Right. Uh, actually, the United States are way more advanced on that field than here. In principle, the Netherlands is not a suing country. I mean, United States are unique in that way that they're going to sue for everything. Yeah. But here, that's not the culture. We don't have a suing culture, just to put it that way. Dutch like to, you know, form committees, and we're going to talk with you, and we're going to talk again, and, you know, talk about the cause, and hope they implement stuff, and I don't have the patience for that. That's the reason I'm in no just committees. Because uh, mm. I think you can talk only so much, but how do we actually get change? I'm thinking about that still because you can talk and talk, but sometimes, I mean, I really not soon, but how do we affect change? Right. Right. People only want to change during a crisis or when it's so obviously better for them that they want to go to the new state. Yes, yes. And, and... Oh, you know, if they can see they're going to win more money with it, just like you said. Right, right. Do you think it's right. hard to prove that? Uh, even if I wonder. You... But even if I say 13% increase, they respond with, yeah, but what is it going to cost me? Of course, of course. <laughs> and that's the funny thing. If you think about inclusiveness and accessibility right from the start of your project, it's not going to cost you that much. Right, right, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. If you do it from day one, it's not going to cost you that much. Like coding well to start instead of fixing bugs after the launch. Right. It's really that simple, especially for technology, for screen readers. The moment you have your HTML code done right, according mm -hmm. to web standards, you are already almost yeah, fully accessible, right? Yeah, right? right, right. But then we are going to add a JavaScript framework, and then mm -hmm. we're going to add this, and we're going to add that, and by the end of the day, you know? So it's not that hard, it's not that, and, and like I said, so we're going to have to talk jargon with people who create those website, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to talk uh, business with the people who pay for those right. websites and service. So it's, a, it's kind of uh, fighting on two fronts. What's, what's the best front to fight? I think the developers, because, um, you know, if you're hired by a business, I think you as a developer mm -hmm. have the obligation to inform. It's my job and I'm, I have made several websites and you know, she's are your visitors and also it's the law, no? I kind of feel, you know, I'm a front-end developer and when I talk to people about website, people that don't put that, I explain to them. You know, why it's important to do this and why it's important to do that. So I kind of feel as a job. But maybe that's just me, you know? I see it for my work to be focused on the business because I want to influence the what and the why more so than I currently care about the how. Let me read. Um, focus on that business. Okay, I understand what you are saying. I mean, the how is being taken care of. If you see the lineup at congresses lately, I mean, here in the Netherlands, we get several talks in Congress about accessibility. So I feel that's being taken care of. And I feel like it's our job too, you know? I, write, I do my part with writing web blogs about it. And, and the what and the why is a big thing. You know, why your service will be accessible. And that's a good point. I mean, I'm not someone who can talk manager. You know what I mean? Well, um, I don't think you could. <laughs> maybe I could. Maybe I could. You know, I, I was asked last to speak at some event for a big company, but unfortunately, it didn't fit in my shadow. But maybe I should think about if I am able to do it once, to speak more, yes, non-jargon. Even if they're developers, they, I mean, the developers will get it either way, jargon or no jargon. But the business people will profit from hearing the talk, it in non-jargon way. 